right, so you've had a chance to look at this problem. A little stuck on where you're trying to go. Um, let's first try to understand what the problem is and then how we're trying to get to an answer. Um, what the problem is, is we start with this expression up here, the absolute value of x plus 5 over 2x plus 10. And when we take x equals negative 5, we plug in negative 5 for x, what we get, at least for our knowledge at this point in our mathematical careers, is an undefined type answer. So where we're trying to go to ultimately solve this problem is we're trying to manipulate this expression. We've got some hints here to help us where if we manipulate the expression, we can then take the negative 5 for x, plug in, and we get a real answer back. So when we look at this expression, what stands out is we do have absolute value in it. And if we review the definition for absolute value, definition for absolute value is right here. Basically, absolute value boils down to two parts. Now, if we use that understanding for the definition of the absolute value, then basically, if we're taking the absolute value of x plus 5, Wherever I see a little a up here in my definition, I can replace that with x plus 5 down here to create a new definition that's more specific to this problem. So the absolute value of x plus 5 is going to be, according to this, x plus 5, when x plus 5 is greater than or equal to 0. Now, because we're being real specific eventually here with a value of x being equal to negative 5, might make more sense to write this inequality out where x is greater than or equal to negative 5. In other words, just solve this inequality for x so that we can compare to negative 5 a little more easily. Now, if we continue with the second part of this definition of absolute value and transfer it down here to something more specific like the absolute value of x plus 5, what we find is we're taking the opposite, we're applying a negative, 2x plus 5. So that's going to be true when x plus 5 is less than 0. Or again, if we solve for x, x is less than negative 5. Okay, if we simplify this a little bit, because we know eventually x needs to equal negative 5, we could narrow our focus based on this definition to this first piece because if x is going to equal negative 5, this would be the piece where x could equal negative 5. That means the absolute value of x plus 5, we could substitute that with just x plus 5. So let's take that original expression now, come down here a little ways. So here we're going to simplify this expression based on what we know now about our definition for absolute value and the rules we need to follow to uh, help us do a little creative substitution here. We're going to take this absolute value of x plus 5. We're going to take that out and replace it with the x plus 5. We're going to put that over 2x plus 10. Now if you go back to some of the hints that were given up here in the original part says to help answer this question consider a couple of things first how do you simplify a rational expression well basically we simplify a rational expression by factoring so is this new expression we set up factorable yes it is the numerator would be x plus 5 but the denominator we can take a 2 out of meaning x plus 5 is left so if you look at how that's been factored now, the x plus 5's would cancel out. And as those cancel out, of course, 1's hold their places, meaning this expression simplifies to 1 half. Now, we're trying to evaluate this where x equals negative 5. Tiny problem here. There's no x's left in our simplified form to plug into. But since there's no x's left, then we can assume that this form would be simplified to 1 half, where if we had to evaluate it at x equals negative 5, we would still get 1 half back. So 1 half is our answer here. All right, we turn to that final page now, to this last problem, which really is a great problem. The reason it's a great problem is it's kind of laying the foundation for what are some pretty big calculus topics. 
And eventually when you see the applications of these topics, you, you appreciate why we're putting in the work here that we are. So the short story is basically we're trying to determine the slope of a line that's passing through a given point. What we know is that point is on this curve. But the problem is when we find a slope, the formula we use is the difference in the y's over the difference in the x's, meaning we need two points and we only have one. So we get creative. If we know this point on this line is gonna be one seven and the x value is basically one, we pick surrounding x values and analyze those points. And we basically find the slope of the lines through those points compared back to the original one and see if some kind of pattern unfolds. Through that pattern, usually we can uh, at least come up with a reasonable approximation for what the slope of the line would be going through this point. So if we select these values that surround x equals one and the values that I've prompted you with here, three, two, 1.5 and so on, since these are all gonna be surrounding points on the same curve, what you can do to figure out the calculation pretty quickly and start completing this chart for guidance, you can go to your calculator, and on your calculator, go to y equals, and for y equals, plug in your function. And now make sure that your table, so second window, your table setup, has the independent variable on ask. In this case, mine does. If yours doesn't, go over, highlight it, hit enter. Then go to your table, hit second graph. On the table, go ahead and plug in these values. So as you can see, I've already done that. And when you plug in those values, we get our corresponding y values back. So when x is 3, y is 39. When x is 2, y is 20 and so on down the line here. 1.5 goes with 12.75, 1.1 uh, goes with 8.03, 1.01 goes with 7.1003. Now once we have an X and a Y, we have an ordered pair. So when X is three, Y is 39, our ordered pair is 339. When X is two, Y is 20, our ordered pair is 220. And we can fill in this next column here. So now that we have some second points to work with, which remember, that's part of the problem here. We're trying to find the slope of the line that passes through one point. We only know how to find slopes of lines given two points. So this column now basically represents a second point that we can use. If we start with the first point of 339 and try to find the slope of the line that goes through that point on this curve and the original point in question, 17 on this curve, off to the side here to find that slope, Taking the difference in the y's, well, let's start with the, uh, the new point of 339. y would be 39. Subtract the y value from the original point, 7. Put that over. x value for the new point is 3 minus x value of the original point, which is 1. If we do some calculating here, we get 32 over 2, meaning the slope is going to be 16. Now, if we go to the next point. Take the point 220, find its slope off to the side. Well, the y value at this new point is 20. We're subtracting the y value at the original point is 7. We're putting that over the x value at the new point is 2 minus the x value at the original point of 1. Calculating that out, we get 13 over 1, obviously 13. So 13 is going to be the slope for that line that passes through the point 17 and 220. If we continue doing this kind of work off to the side, and yeah, I know it's a little tedious, so eventually there's gonna have to be better ways, but that's what calculus is all about, is finding those better ways. Uh, the remaining calculations we get for slopes here. When we use the point 1.5 and 12.75, we try to find the slope of the line that passes through that point in 1.7, we get 11.5. For the next point, the slope would be 10.3 if we did that calculation. And for the final point here, 
the slope of the line that would pass through the original point and this new point would be 10.03. Since we've selected x values that are getting closer and closer and closer to this x value of 1 at the original point, if we look at the trend that the slope follows, we could assume that if we eventually get to that point and had to find the slope of that line, that the slope of that line appears to be 10 in this case, right? Because that's what the numbers trend towards. So this problem, although a little tedious, is really just about finding some slopes and some lines and looking at a pattern. If you can do that, you can at least get started in calculus. Now let's go down to part B here. Part B starts to touch on actually easier ways to do a problem like part A. There are some connections that eventually would be made here in a calculus class. So in this one, if we read through it, a line passes through one point on a curve. The point the line passes through is negative 2, 4, and the equation for the curve is given as y equals 3x squared plus 4x. So same equation as what we were using in the previous problem. Now apparently, there's a special formula we can use to find the slope of this line, but if I cut to the chase now, using this formula, find the equation of the line which passes through this point, express your answer using point slope form. You know, let's think about what we're trying to do here. We're trying to find an equation. We're trying to find an equation of what is ultimately going to be known as a tangent line because it only passes through one point. And how we're forming that equation, we're using point slope form. So to review that, that's y minus y sub 1 equals our slope m times x minus x sub 1 where x sub 1 and y sub 1 represent a given point, and we know that here to be negative 2, 4. m, of course, is our slope, which we'll need this special formula to find. So if we go ahead and plug in what we know, y value at the given point is 4. Slope we still need to find. x value at the given point is negative 2, so x minus negative 2 be x plus 2. We need to find this guy right here. If we do, we've got our answer. So to find the slope, Let's consider this special formula. Breaking this down, to find the slope of this line, a formula is applied to the given equation where for every term, the exponent on the independent variable. OK, I'm going to stop there for a minute. The independent variable, what's that? The independent variable is going to be x for a function. And we're looking at the exponent right now on these two terms. So the exponent here is 2, the exponent here is 1. Okay, if I continue on, it says it's multiplied to the coefficient. Okay, wait a minute, the coefficient. The coefficient on these terms, well, it's 3 in the first one, 4 in the second. Well, at the same time, 1 is subtracted from the original exponent to create new powers on the variables. Okay, so if I put that all together, what it's saying is take this exponent, multiply it to the coefficient. So 2 times 3 is 6. Got your variable still of x. The new power on the variable comes from subtracting 1 from this power. So 2 minus 1, new power here is 1. So 6x is my result using this new formula on the term 3x squared. We're adding on. Okay, if we apply this formula now to the 4x part, you're taking this exponent 1, bringing it down to the 4, multiplying that. So 1 times 4, 4. Now we've got x, and if we subtract 1 from this power, 1 minus 1 is 0, we have x to the 0 power. Well, anything to the 0 power is 1. So it would be 4 times 1, meaning 4 is all that's left when I apply this formula to 4x. This is my formula for finding the slope. So to actually get the slope, let's consider our point again. Our point is negative 2, 4. The only thing we have in terms of variables for the slope is x's. We want to find this slope when x equals would be negative 2, right? That's the x-coordinate in our point. So we take negative 2, we plug in, do our calculation, and we get negative 8 back. Meaning the equation for this line in point slope form would 
be y minus 4 equals negative 8 times the quantity x plus 2.